Well, we read Psalm 17 earlier on. We have spent nine weeks of this lockdown thinking about being under his wings, under the wings of the Lord based on Psalm 91, under the shadow of the wings of God. And the thought also appears in four other Psalms. And so for the next four weeks, including tonight, we'll look at these texts and notice the connection with the character, with the person of our blessed Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, which suggests themselves in these Psalms. Now we read the first of these uh, four Psalms earlier, Psalm 17, where we find these words in verse 8, Keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings, from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. So in Psalm 17 there is a hiding place, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. And then in Psalm 36 and verse 7 there's a trusting place. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Next week's text, we'll think about that. And then thirdly, in Psalm 57 and verse 1, there's a place of refuge. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. So, a place of refuge. And then the fourth place is a place of rejoicing, for it is in Psalm 63 and verse 7, Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Well, may the Lord help us as we direct our thoughts to the person of our blessed Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But first, a few thoughts about Psalm 17 itself. The hiding place in Christ, we can be safe from the enemy of souls. The psalm is called and headed here, A Prayer of David, A Prayer of David. He calls on God to hear this righteous man, hear the right, he says. David was not claiming sinless perfection here, but he did believe that his faith in the Lord God gave him the right to call upon God David would not have been a man after God's own heart if he had not been a man of prayer. He has been called a master in the sacred art of supplication. And as soon as is necessary, he flies to the Lord God. And he goes in prayer, just like a ship's captain steers to the nearest port when a storm is forecast and threatened. There are so many prayers of David in the Bible that it's difficult to fully count them. And towards the end of this psalm, there's a smell of the furnace, of heat in the words of the psalm. But the last verse gives us the indication that the flame did not touch him and he came out unharmed and unscathed. As for me, verse 15, I will behold thy face in righteousness I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Now the first four verses, we find David requesting that the Lord God was act as a judge, consider his case as an honest man before those who were oppressing him, that is King Saul and all his men. David had the testimony of a good conscience. He was being wrongly criticised and chased. And it was uh, good that God knew his servant. He knew what David was like, his character and his integrity. And my friends, that can be a help to us when we go through trying times. And we can know again that the Lord knows, the Lord sees, the Lord hears every word. The Lord uh, knows that when we go through trying times that there will be relief for us. And if we have that desire to be tried and tested of the Lord and be found innocent, then all will be well with us. Search me, O God, says Psalm 113, 9, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And then in verses 5 to 6, David asked the Lord for grace. Grace to act properly and righteously during his time of trial. He knows that God is aware of all that's happening to him. You know, it was said of the philosopher Plato, who said to his disciples, When men speak ill of thee, live so that no one will believe them. Very wise advice, particularly for those who are under pressure. We'll have to admit that trials and under trials, it's not always easy to behave ourselves properly. But prayer is the answer. And David shows us the way to cope. And if we want to be preserved, we should cry to the preserver, God himself. We should call to the one, the only one, who can help us. And David is showing us this here. And from verses 7 to 12, he seeks God's protection from his enemies. And he graphically describes these enemies. Notice what he says. They are wicked oppressors. They are deadly enemies. They are circling, doesn't say it here in the scripture, but he's, they're circling like red Indians around a wagon train of settlers. He feels surrounded. The enemies enclosed, in fact, it's a, a metaphor for those who encircle the people of God with a net to trap the prey. And they have proud eyes, says David. They have proud mouths. They are greedy like lions, lions describing the hostile pursuing man of Saul. And in this section is our text, keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. How David loved this expression, how he thought of chickens, as we thought of in the early sermons in Psalm 91 of a chicken spreading out her wings to shelter her young, the shadow of the wings. And then finally, David pleads with the Lord that the oppressors would be disappointed and that he would escape. And he says this in these words, cast him down, this enemy, disappoint him, deliver me from men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. This indeed is an interesting verse. The enemies are bound to the earth, earthbound. They live for today, they have no eye for the eternal future. They live for the here and now. And all they can do is to leave their gains to their children. No thought of an eternal future like David, David, who according to the last verse makes a triumphant station, statement. Unlike these men of the world, he says, I am satisfied with my God. Men are satisfied with sons. The Christian is satisfied with the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is David's confession and proclamation. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Now, what is David saying? He's saying, I neither envy nor covet these men's happiness. I have a better hope. And my better hope is to see the Lord God, to see his face and be changed by that vision of his image so as to be partaker of his righteousness. That is what I want, says David. And so in my present condition, I cheerfully waive all my present enjoyments. My satisfaction is to come in the future. I shall sleep a while. But when the trumpet sounds, I shall awake to everlasting joy because I will arise to the likeness of God my King. And my brothers and sisters, we can have the same view of our future, the same positive view of this future, compared to what the world offers. Heaven 
is a glorious future. Compared with this deep fullness of wonderful light beaming from our Saviour in glory that we'll one day see with new eyes, the joys of the unbelieving worldly person are just like a glow worm in the light of the beaming and bright, bright shining sun, or a drop of a bucket to the vast and the shining sea. And this then is the gist of this psalm, number 17. But it leads us this evening now to focus on the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, Keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. And when we think of David's trials that he went through, we can also observe that the Lord Jesus Christ knew well what it was to be surrounded by evil men, enemies to the truth of his messiahship. But he also waited quietly upon God's justice as they attacked him, like lions. And if ever there was a person who had the right to cry out for justice, it was the innocent son of the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet all he received was the insult and the injury of men, wicked men, but he received it ever so meekly. What a strength this was in our Saviour. Surely it causes us to desire to follow in his footsteps. And having triumphed as a man, he is well qualified to hide us under the shadow of his wings. Now to point us in the right direction, thinking of our dear Saviour, turn back for a moment to Matthew 12 and those verses from verse 18, thinking of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll look at two aspects of his character this evening uh, from the scripture. But Matthew 12 and verse 18. First of all, he is seen as the chosen one. Matthew 12, 18. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. <coughs> I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So we have here a picture of the one who is called the servant, my servant, whom I have chosen. Now it is a lovely term for the Son of God. This title was given to our blessed Lord in several prophecies. Here's two of them in Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I uphold. This is the passage that Matthew quotes in his gospel. Behold my servant whom I uphold. Mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. God is asking us to look at his Son. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, the chosen one. And in the verse 2 of chapter 53 of Isaiah, a well-loved and well-known passage, it says that he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And we can ask tonight, what was the Lord Jesus Christ chosen to do? Was it merely to bring the gospel of the kingdom of heaven to earth and to preach it to the people of God? Was it merely to represent his Father in the lower parts of creation, the earth? No. No, my friends, it was much more than this. And Isaiah's second quotation from Isaiah 53 gives us the real role for the Lord Jesus Christ and for what he was chosen to do, to be led like a lamb to the slaughter 
and as a sheep before her shearers was dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was chosen to be wounded for our transgressions. He was chosen to be bruised for our iniquities. He was chosen that the chastisement of our peace would be upon him, and he was chosen to bear the stripes, those scourging stripes, so that we might be healed as he was scourged for our sins. And men may well have refused him as their Messiah, as men refused David as their king, yet he was the chosen one. Mine elect, says the Lord God. And Jesus never gave up on the work that the Father had chosen for him to do. God didn't choose an angel to die for our sins. He chose his only dearly begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And having been chosen for this task, Jesus submitted himself willingly to the task. Psalm 40 declares this in his own words. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Now, this, of course, was written hundreds of years before Jesus actually came to Bethlehem, into the womb of the Virgin Mary, and was born. I delight to do thy will, O my God. And at the end of his life he prayed to his Father. We find it in John 17, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The work that thou gavest me to do. The work that thou didst choose for me to do. I finish the work. When he says, I have finished, he means to include his death because he spoke those words in John 17 before he died. But he was including that death in his statement. For as he dies in agony on the cross at Calvary, he then utters those words, one word in the, word in the Greek, testelestai, but in the English, it is finished. All the preparations for his death had been made. He had preached the gospel. He had done many things to display and to show that he was the Messiah. He had preached to the Jews. He would given them full proof that he was indeed the Messiah. He had collected together his disciples and sent them out to preach and taken them with him in his preaching tours. He had taught them the nature of the faith of the Lord God of that religion of Christ and he had given them his parting counsel and there was nothing remaining to be done but to return to his father and we see here that Jesus was careful that his great and important work should be done before his dying hour he didn't postpone it to be performed just as he was leaving the world so completely had he done his work that even before his death he could say, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Charles Wesley wrote, "'Tis finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sins but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice, the great redeeming work is done. Tis finished, all the debt is paid. Justice divine is satisfied, the grand and full atonement made, God for a guilty world hath died. How much better it would be if people would imitate his example by not leaving their great work of life to be done on a deathbed. We Christians should have our work accomplished, should be about the business of the Master now. And when that hour approaches when we should be taken, we'll have nothing to do but to die. And we'll be ready and return to our Father in heaven. And as we regard our dear Lord Jesus Christ as the chosen of God, 
we can turn our thoughts to Philippians 2, a famous passage. Verse 7 says, But he made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man. And God required an acceptable and perfect sacrifice from man. But he didn't get it. Man being sinful had no ability to produce it. The Lord Jesus Christ, by taking upon himself the nature of a man, fully performed the whole will of God, and then he communicates grace to his followers to enable them to perfectly love and worthily magnify their maker. And Jesus was the chosen one to do this. The chosen one. God's choice for us is precious and should be to each of us this evening. The precious Son of God. Is Jesus precious to you, my brother, my sister, my friend perhaps who is seeking the Lord tonight? You can know him in his preciousness if you trust him as your saviour and repent of your sins. He is the precious chosen one of God and it is under the shadow of his cross, the chosen one's cross, that we find the shelter that we need. One of our hymns says, O safe and happy shelter, O refuge tried and sweet, O trysting place, where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. It's a shelter. It's the shadow of his cross. It is the hiding place, the chosen one's cross, where we find the shelter we need. Wesley also said in another of his hymns, then let us sit beneath his cross and gladly catch the healing stream. All things account to him but loss and give up all our hearts to him. Come feel with me his blood applied. My Lord, my love, is crucified. So let us all by faith shelter beneath the wings of Christ, the Chosen One. But he also has another name that we can think of tonight. And it's Jesus Christ, the Obedient One. He is the Chosen One, but he's also the Obedient One. Again in Isaiah chapter 42, Behold, my servant, look at him. Behold the servant. This is the servant who would never fail not to be, never fail, he would never fail and he would not be discouraged. The Lord Jesus delighted to do his father's will. At the beginning of his life in his childhood, only 12 years old, he was found amongst the doctors of the law in the temple in Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph came anxiously looking for him, worried out of their minds that they had lost him, thought he was with other members of the company of the family on the way to the feast day. And when his anxious earthly parents found him, he said to them, Wished ye not that I should be about my father's business? Why were you so anxious? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? There it is in Luke 2, verse 49. Why have you sought me with so much anxiety? And of course Mary should have known that the Son of God, her precious Son of God, was safe. That his heavenly Father would look after him and make him safe. And that he could do, do nothing amiss. Do you not know, says Jesus, you had reason to know. You knew what my mission was in coming into the world and that my commission was superior to the duty of obeying earthly parents and that they should be willing always to give me up to the proper business for which I live and for what I, which I have come and I am a servant to my heavenly father. My father's business. Now some think that this should be translated I should be about the business of my father's house that is, in the temple. And Jesus reminded them here that he came down to earth from heaven, that he had a higher father than an earthly parent. 
that even in his earthly life it was proper that he be engaged in the Father's business in the work for which he came. And of course he did not start his public work for another 18 years after this incident of the 12-year-old going to the temple. Yet still the work of God was his work, even in his childhood. <laughs> and it was proper for him to be engaged in the great business as that servant of the Lord God, as that chosen one, and as the obedient one, to do what he came down to, from heaven to earth to do. Because after this in Luke 2 we do read that he did obey. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. I wonder if we will learn from our Saviour, my friends. This man was God, yet he learned obedience within the Godhead, the Son obeying the Father. Surely we can see that this was setting us a pattern of obedience to the Lord God. From the beginning of his life to the very end of his life, the Lord Jesus Christ was obedient to his Father's will. At the end, remember these very familiar words that we quoted from earlier in Philippians 2, that he was in the form of God. And being in that form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I wonder if we can imagine this. The Father sent his Son into the world to die. The Son in obedience came into the world to die. The will of God was to offer his Son as a sacrifice for sin, and he obediently complied. In John's Gospel we find his words in chapter 5 and verse 30, I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Oh, my friends, what obedience is this? Can we come anyway near the obedience of our blessed Saviour's obedience? Jesus' obedience to death teaches us this, that his love for us was stronger than death. Oh, how he loved us. He loved us so much that he laid down his life for us in obedience to his Father. And our hiding place is beneath the umbrella of the obedience of Christ. We have been disobedient to God's law and we deserve his punishment. Jesus was totally obedient and took our punishment. And this is where you and I hide tonight, my friends. We cannot earn salvation because we have disobeyed already and we are condemned. But because we can identify with the blessed, obedient Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, then his obedience as part of his righteousness is accounted to us. What a thought that is. It's hardly credible. Our disobedience wiped out by his obedience and therefore our acceptance with the Father. Well, let's be glad on this Lord's Day evening that Jesus, the chosen and obedient Son of God, Son of the Father, is our shelter and our security in this life and at the day of judgment. And may we, each of us, 
pray David's prayer with great confidence every day, not only in troublous times, but every day. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Amen.